Coming up on today's show, Jess Shade is a high-altitude ski mountaineer, queer cis woman, poly person, and clinical mental health counselor licensed in Utah and Michigan. Jess works closely with Utah's LGBTQ+, kink, and poly communities, and serves on the board of the LGBTQ+, Affirmative Therapist Guild of Utah. Additionally, Jess supports members of the mountain sports and snow safety communities. Welcome to Loving Without Boundaries, where we hear inspiring stories, share actionable advice, and talk about the challenges and the joys of ethical non-monogamy and polyamory. I'm your host, Kitty Shambliss. Coming up after the break, my conversation with Jess Shade. Are you bored with dick pics? Do random hookups and empty chats kill your vibe? Tired of being catfished or wasting time with messages from faceless profiles? Then you need to get Monogamish, a new dating app designed for singles and couples of all genders and sexualities, looking for dates, mates, and everything in between. Access exclusive matchmaking events, workshops with dating and sexuality gurus, and exclusive offers so hot you'll just have to see for yourself. Download Monogamish for free from Google Play or the Apple App Store. Monogamish. Explore fluid relationships. Welcome back to Loving Without Boundaries, where I am really excited to be here with Jess Shade, who I had the honor and the privilege of getting to enjoy her workshop over at Southwest Love Fest, April 2023, which is the first time I've been back to that conference since uh, pre-pandemic. The last time I went was 2019, and they did not disappoint. And Jess's workshop, Polyamory and Attachment, was awesome. I'm sure we're going to talk about that. But I just want to say welcome. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here to have a conversation. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Awesome. Yeah. And I know that you weren't super familiar with the podcast. I'm glad you were able to check that out and be one of our esteemed speakers to come on. So with that, I'd love it if you would just share a little bit about who you are, your story. I already read your bio to our listeners, but I'd love you to just talk about yourself in your own words for a few minutes. Sure. Yeah. Um, So my name is Jess. I work and live in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm a therapist and I work with all adults and individuals, couples, polycules, systems. Um, And mostly my two specialties there are the LGBTQ plus population, poly folks, kinky folks, and then another group of people, which are mountain athletes. Um, ski mountaineering is a great passion of mine, and I'm also a queer, ethical, non-monogamous, identified person. So identities play a lot into my work, and I think that that makes it pretty rich and hopefully helpful to my clients, too. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. And I remember thinking that was interesting, too, that you not only serve some of the same communities that I do, and that you also specialize with mountain athletes, which is really cool. So. Um, interesting niche. So I'd love to ask you what I call your light bulb moment. Like when you were maybe growing up, was there a moment that you knew that maybe in some way, shape or form, you were just a little bit different, unusual, that you might be not quite like all the other kids and uh, an inkling that you might be coloring outside of the lines of heteronormative monogamy in a way that worked for you? Yes. Um, I'm not sure if there was a single light bulb moment growing up so much as a series of of experiences. Uh, And most of those were just around like performative gender norms that I really never hit quite right. I was the last girl to play Little League Baseball. I grew up in the South. Um, I was always a tomboy in trees. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized um, that I was queer and that it was actually my now ex-wife who introduced me to the whole idea of non-monogamy. Mm-hmm. Growing up in the conservative Christian South, that was never on my radar. Um, mm-hmm. And so I guess that was a light bulb moment, but that came well into my 20s. But throughout my childhood, I definitely, <laughs> I was the weird girl. The weird mm-hmm. girl always with dirty knees and hair sticking up in <laughs> photos. And 
Yeah, just not quiet in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for sharing that. It's very relatable. I can definitely re relate. I was the weird girl, but maybe in just some different ways. But I, I think it's just a relatable story the way you're describing it. And that's interesting, too, that you weren't really aware of ethical non-monogamy until in your in your 20s. I'm curious, where in the South did you grow up? We moved around a lot, but I claim Atlanta is home. It's the most oh, okay. cumulative time. Uh, I went to grad school in Atlanta, so I lived there as an adult. Mm -hmm. So, but and throw a dart at the Southeast and you'll catch somewhere I lived probably close to at mm -hmm. some point. That's so interesting. So um, thank you for sharing all that. So as you were learning about ethical non-monogamy, was that while you were with your your ex-wife? So in that relationship? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, maybe six weeks into dating, she's like, we have to talk. And I was like, oh, gosh, okay. And she's like, I can never be monogamous. And I had no idea what to say in response to that. Uh, at the time, I figured we probably we hadn't had the like exclusive define the relationship sort of question and answer session yet. So I was like, well, uh, I wasn't expecting we were monogamous right now, but what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, and I was guiding at the time. And so I was working eight days on six days off. And my thought was, well, this doesn't bother me. It's a new idea and I'm not sure what to do with it. And I was like, well, how about when I'm on my six days off, you prioritize me. But when I'm in the middle of nowhere with no cell reception and no contact for eight days, be safe, have fun. I don't really want to know details yet because I'm not quite sure what to do with this concept. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of the the initiation, I suppose, into a whole new way of thinking about relationships and about you know, the amount of choice we have as humans mm -hmm. um, versus the very narrow confines of what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. I love that you were able to get creative and almost logical, <laughs> but in a healthy way about how to do this and doing yeah. it, almost practicing some self-care and some boundaries. And honestly, it takes a lot of bravery to do that, especially if you did have a really, you know, a conservative Christian background. Just be like, all right, let me try on this new idea for size. Mm -hmm. So one question I have is what were maybe some of the the initial challenges that you had in those early stages and how did you navigate through those? Mm, yeah, I think one of the big challenges was just deconstructing this idea that sexual exclusivity, let alone the emotional components of it, but that sexual exclusivity somehow produces security in a relationship. Um, I think early on, especially as we got closer and closer over the first couple of years of our relationship, um, it was a struggle for me to trust. Uh, but trust I did, and I was encouraged and supported by her. Um, I listened to a lot of the Savage Love cast at the time. Uh, and this idea that other people had found ways to sort of break some of those, you know, heteronormative, mononormative, societal expectations. Um, that was really helpful, hearing other people's questions and stories. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that was a way that helped overcome both speaking with my former wife and then listening to that podcast. Mm -hmm. One question I have for you is knowing what you know now, is there anything that you wish you'd maybe known or maybe any guidance you would have given to your younger self when you were at those early stages? Sure. Um, I think... I think my younger self did a pretty good job. I mean, the first thing <laughs> that awesome. yeah, the first thing that jumped to mind was like, would she have want to have known that ultimately we would part ways really amicably? Uh, and I think no. I think I would have spared her that knowledge. Um, but but I do. I think I went at a really measured pace, mm. and that my job guiding helped because I was only present twelve days a month, and. It was almost like I had double time to experience and process 
So I don't know if if perhaps listeners who aren't guides with such an odd schedule are struggling with it. Pacing, I think slowing down pacing was sort of a natural piece of my landscape mm-hmm. at the time, which was so helpful. Mm-hmm. And when you say guiding, I assume you mean mountain guiding? I was working as a wilderness therapy guide. So wow. Yeah, my my main group were young adults with autism, and I would take them rock climbing and backpacking and skiing, all kinds of activities, and mm-hmm. work with their therapist to make those activities as therapeutic as possible. Wow, that's amazing. And um, we'll get more into your work, but it sounds like that was a almost like a great entryway into where you are now. That is yeah, so it's huge. Cool. Mm-hmm. So before we start talking a little bit more about your work, whatever you would care to share, what would you say is your your current reality where you're at on your your ENM journey or identifying as as queer or anything else that you feel is would be helpful for somebody to hear here on our interview? Definitely. Well, I I'm single for the first time in over a decade. After this sort of beautiful landscape of different relationships, uh, including you know, my my former wife, we were together for about nine years and uh, I had several boyfriends towards the end of our relationship, even bridging, you know, our divorce. And I'm so grateful for each of those. Um, but I find myself right now for the first time solely in relationship with myself. And it's strange. Last mm-hmm. time I was single, single, I had a flip phone. Well, like, what is this? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, <right>. Hold on. <laughs> The world has changed. Um, so yes, that's where I'm currently at. Though I certainly, I still identify as queer. I still identify as ethically non-monogamous. Uh, though I think the parts of my life which are most active right now are sort of my own relationship with myself, my friends, my work, um, and then training. So I'm I'm headed to Bolivia for most of the summer to climb mountains. And wow. yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a joyful and free space mm. in that regard. Mm. I love that. Because yeah, I think so many people, and I'm sure you see this in your work, can feel a lot of anxiety and fear around being alone. And me too. Into loneliness. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So you're here. Yeah. Welcome. Oh, to- 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I love that you're, what I heard is that you're kind of focusing on the, the joyfulness and the, and the freedom and giving yourself some maybe grace to get to know yeah. yourself at this moment in time. And why not travel? And I can't believe you're going to Bolivia. That's awesome to climb some mountains. So yeah, that sounds incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to, I, I don't know, see the opportunities in this point in time. And then I think becoming more familiar with loneliness. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if this maps to your experience, Kitty, but for me, when I had both my wife and a very serious boyfriend, loneliness was not very often or maybe at all part of my landscape um, because those relationships were fulfilling and so nurturing in that way that and th- I was busy, quite frankly, like there's only 24 hours in a day. And I spent a lot of that time with my people. And and so I think in a way, like loneliness, it's something that is more maybe poignant because it had been absent for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is, it's an it's a interesting time in, in my life right now to get used to that and to sort of befriend that and see what mm-hmm. I can learn about myself through it. Um, and to not sugarcoat it, sometimes it really does suck. So. Mm-hmm. Mm. But there's a yes and here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I appreciate your vulnerability, you know, instead of just, oh, things are all hunky dory, you know, admitting that to all of us, because we, I think everyone here can relate to fear of being alone or to loneliness. And um, I can totally relate to that, including sometimes even in relationship if maybe you're feeling disconnected or emotionally distant with your partner, or you're just not on the same page, that can even feel lonely. So, um, yeah. So I, I appreciate just where you're finding yourself in time. And I love what you said about just becoming more familiar with loneliness and saying, Hey friend, what can I learn from you? 
Mm-hmm. Is there any nuggets of wisdom that you can say you have learned at this point in, in your life? I I think that the first thing perhaps that comes up in response to that is this idea of remembering and returning. So like we go through large transitions in life, whether it's career or partners changing, family transitions, life being born, people dying, whatever it is. And I think when we have those large inflection points, there's grief and loss or joy and excitement. But this idea of like returning to our own center and remembering parts of ourselves that maybe we've gotten away from. Mm-hmm. And I think what I'm trying to do right now is sort of learn to stay in this place and remember the parts of myself that I hadn't perhaps emphasized as much over the last decade while being in different relationships and calling forth like, what do I want to keep? What no longer serves me? What do I want to add? Um, and, and so, yes, it's, I guess, a mix of things, both remembering and adding, Mm -hmm. um, but that's what I'd say. Yeah, no, that's really, really beautiful because I think we can sometimes get so involved with relationships and be excited about finding new things that become part of that relationship. But when we do that, we could lose some of our own individuality, um, Mm -hmm. whether it's because of the relationship or if we're running our own business, for example, I mm-hmm. I love playing guitar and singing, but while I'm building this business, I just don't have a lot of time for that. But as you were talking, it made me think about that. Like that is a part of myself I miss and I love. So I think it's valuable what you were saying. Just you know, what what do I want to bring back into my life? You know, and what do I what do I want to let go? So really beautiful. So I'd love to, um, I love what you were sharing about the the wilderness um, nature guide work. I'd love if you could just t- take us a little bit more into your your professional life. Like how did that journey start that brought you to where you are today? Yeah, no, the, the wilderness guiding was what Michelle Obama calls a swerve. It was not my original career trajectory. Um, mm-hmm. Initially, my plan had been to teach religion at an academic level, at university level, and then to do archaeology. And so I went through college and a master's degree, worked in Israel digging as an archaeologist. And through a series of strange closed doors, I found myself Googling jobs that are outside that help people because I thought to take a break. I'll take a break from academia. I'm just going to be in my mid-20s and have an adventure. And uh, Google was new, but the algorithm works well enough to show me about uh, wilderness therapy, which I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. And next thing I knew, I was living in my truck in Utah, a state where I knew no one, guiding young adults with autism for eight days at a time in the wilderness doing activities as a group and trying to help folks experientially sort of work through the kinks of what it is to be human. Um, And it was tremendous. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd stay for two years and here I am, what, 11 years later. (laughs) Utah has been like Velcro. It's totally hooked me. (laughs) So you're still doing all of that today? The wilderness therapy was a chapter I closed after about four years. Um, I went back to grad school for a different master's so that I could be a therapist, which is what I am now. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I've opened my own practice last year, um, seeing clients. I'm licensed in Utah and in Michigan. Um, And I work with a bunch of different groups and organizations, which I'm just thrilled to to be able to partner with um, that. The LGBTQ Affirmative Therapist Guild of Utah, it's a mm-hmm. phenomenal organization. It's been around 25 years, which oh, wow. I don't know where your listeners are from, but I know not being from Utah, I kind of thought certain stereotypes about the state, some of which are definitely well-placed. Mm-hmm. But there's also a strong community of folks here who support queer rights and advocacy and Mental health education um, for clinicians is a big part of what we call it the guild because it's such a long name. 
mm-hmm. does. And so I've been on the board of that for a few years and uh, just a lot of joy to be part of that organization. Mm-hmm. How awesome. Well, I love hearing just about your your journey and how you got there and you doing what I call, if you like the movie, The Matrix, following the white rabbit, you know, uh-huh. that you had, <laughs> you had this swerve and you're like, this feels good. I'm just going to keep moving down this trajectory and see where it takes me. And I love that just helping people in nature has really created such a beautiful life for you. That's awesome. So um, what I loved was yours was the the second workshop over the day that I had gone to at Southwest Love Fest. And I was so glad that I selected your session because it gets overwhelming when there's three or four things to choose. I was like, all right, this one sounds good. So uh, I really loved it. And it, for our listeners, it was called, if I remember correctly, polyamory and attachment. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners at this point are familiar with Jessica Fern's book, Poly mm-hmm. Secure. She's actually a colleague and friend of mine as well. So I'm curious how, like, how did you start to move into that space of um, maybe studying attachment? Like, how did that process come together that then you created that workshop, which was great, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this is one of those intersections of personal and professional. So throughout my years, first with internship, then with being an associate level license holder, and now fully licensed, um, more and more people started finding me through word of mouth from the poly and ENM communities. And in Utah, I think that that is a distinction because, you know, groups that are minorities kind of find each other. And I was already out there in my work with the queer community. And then, you know, as therapists, we're trained, depending on our orientation, theoretically, how much we share of ourselves with our clients. I come from a feminist multicultural orientation. I really believe in sharing the power dynamics in the room. I'm not the expert on anyone else's life. I'm a professional and maybe I'm an expert on therapeutic techniques, but the person who's sitting with me is certainly the expert on their own lived experience. Mm -hmm. And I think something that can be really helpful and empowering is to be able to say, hey, I'm a queer cis woman and I'm ethically non-monogamous. So I'll have a bit more vocabulary and background in, in our work together. And if I am making any assumptions based on my own lived experience that don't fit yours, dear God, please pump the brakes and tell me. And I'll mm-hmm. also try to be aware. Um, and through that, more and more clients started finding me because the poly community is wonderfully talkative. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, I suppose to answer your question about polyamory and attachment, Fern's book came out at such a great time. I mean, we, it was 2020, the pandemic was happening, all of a sudden pressure was on our systems in ways we hadn't ever seen before, at least in our lifetimes. And I think when, maybe we can define attachment a little bit more if folks aren't familiar, but Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, major major shifts like that put so much pressure on how we relate to ourselves and to others. And that's essentially uh, the foundation of attachment. So all that to say, that workshop kind of came out of my own experience as well as my professional experience. Um, and Jessica Fern's book is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Recommend it all the time. Mm-hmm. So for folks who may not be that familiar with it, do you are you open to giving like kind of a, an overview of the different attachment styles? Sure. Yeah. Um, attachment research started in the 1950s between kids and caregivers, mostly infants and mothers, and then they kept getting more and more children, and eventually adult attachment became an area of study several decades down the line as if we stop being attached when we become adults, which is kind of a funny bias of the Mm -hmm. (laughs) mid-century. But basically, adult attachment theory has posited there's four attachment styles, and these are not necessarily uh, by any means 
fixed, but they're sort of like our natural inclination. And it's based on our lived experience, starting from when we were kids all the way up through the present moment. And the styles are secure, anxious, avoidant. And the fourth style has several different names that get thrown around. It's been called fearful or disorganized. But basically, that one, that fourth style is a mix of anxious and avoidant, depending on circumstance. Um, And I think something that's so important with these styles is the idea that we can consciously look at them, be aware of them, meet ourselves in them and their needs, reassure them, um, and also that it might be really different across relationships. Perhaps with you, I feel very secure, but with someone else, I'm more anxious. And um, so it's it's more complex than just saying, I'm a secure person. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's a lot of shades of gray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that really resonates with me in terms of uh, everything that you just said there. I, I live with my two partners and my husband and I, we've been together 20 years and our values just kind of naturally line up. We hardly ever argue. So I always felt incredibly securely attached to him. And then my other partner, we haven't been together quite as long. Sometimes our values are, you know, at opposite ends of the spectrum, whether it's transparency and privacy, you know, no, nobody's wrong. It's just, you know, but it adds to that feeling of, you know, and so that can feel more insecure in that realm. And um, and even I have a friend that I've been friends with for 45 years. And I would say for 35 years of that relationship, I felt very securely attached in that friendship. And then we went through a really, really rocky period where it didn't feel secure at all. So I think it also changed even over the course of time, you know. So, totally. yeah. So I think it's interesting just to think about that. And up until several years ago, I wasn't even aware of any of this. You know, so it makes so much mm-hmm. sense just to be learning about it and talking about it. I think that's amazing. One uh, one thing that I'd love to hear your perspective on, I believe I learned this from Jessica Fern, but there's like different quizzes that can be taken online. I believe the mm-hmm. one that I took was from Diane Poole Heller, if I'm remembering the name correctly, to just kind of see what your attachment was. And what was interesting is I feel like we our brain wants to say, which one am I? Like, I'm a thing, you know, I'm secure. I'm, you know, and it does come back saying you're mostly X, but then it basically shows you a pie chart of how you, you know, you're all of them. Um, And I was curious if you can maybe speak to that, how an individual could possibly, if you believe that, you know, a person can have like different, different elements of each of those all at the same time. Definitely. Well, and I think that those sorts of like self-assessment measures can be so helpful by way of insight. Like as humans, we, and I think the poly community does a phenomenal job of this, but we we work really well with language and concepts. And if we can put words in experience and we can then think about it and communicate it with our partners, it goes so much farther. So I, I, the first thing I wanted to say was, yes, if a self-assessment can be used as a tool for insight and then therefore better communication. Yahtzee. That's great. (laughs) Um, And I think my caution with any label Mm -hmm. uh, is, is to sort of just sit gently with your own identification with it. Um, For instance, talking about myself, I hit the jackpot with my parents. They're phenomenal. And I had a childhood that had every earmark of secure attachment. And I carry that into my adult relationships. And I realize, especially being a therapist, what a gift that is. And yet, I know myself that I can also, like you said, depending on circumstance, depending on, you know, is this value at play and and are we on different sides of it? I can trend towards anxious in my style. That I can be like, well, I want to check in or, oh, I want to send another text and maybe we can really talk this through. Or did they hear me? Did I hear them? Did we really talk it all the way out? Is is there any, you know, and, and I can find myself being more of a pursuer than maybe is necessary. 
So I know that, for instance, like when I am stressed, when I am really worried about something, when there has been conflict, that although I might be coming from a more secure foundation, my tendency is to move towards an anxious attachment style. And then I can use that to help reassure myself, slow down, Mm -hmm. um, maybe give a little bit more spaciousness to a partner so that they can process without necessarily Mm -hmm. talking it out with me. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I guess, I mean, we we carry all of this. It's all a spectrum. Uh, Often you see diagrams where it looks like it's a grid with like an X and Y axis and you find yourself mapped on it. Um, But I think a pie chart... (laughs) <laughs> with different percentages is probably a more accurate visual representation. Mm-hmm. Thank you for speaking to that. That makes sense. And what I loved is uh, I, what I got out of it. I think I often can lean towards um, a little bit more anxious, but to the pie chart thing, I think sometimes I could even be avoidance. <laughs> Maybe mm-hmm. it is the disorganized one who knows. But what I loved what you said there is having that insight about yourself so that you might reassure yourself, like give yourself like some affirmations and just slowing down instead of maybe knee jerking and giving some space to the partner, like finding out like your magic mix that, that mm-hmm. helps you when then when you're doing your work, then you can turn around and, and help your clients in a better way as well. So that's really awesome. Um, one thing I thought I would bring up is how like for our listeners, How would you say some of this interplays with polyamory? I mean, I gave that example of I'm differently attached to two different partners. Is there anything else you care to highlight about how ethical non-monogamy or polyamory may uh, apply to attachment? Definitely. I I think um, we can do self-reflection and, you know, our own work. But inherently, attachment is about relationship. And we can do a lot with our relationship with ourself. And I always like to highlight that our relationship with ourself and our trust of our own uh, our own way of showing up for ourself, that attachment is key for all others. And attachment, because it's relational, has to be learned, grown, informed by other people and our interactions with them. And so I think for poly folks and ethical non-monogamy in general, inherently you have more relationships, you have more data, you have more opportunity to both sometimes create a stress test for the attachment system Mm -hmm. and therefore increase resilience, increase growth, increase trust sometimes as a couples therapist, I'll have a monogamous couple come in after you know several decades of marriage and be like, this is the first time we've really disagreed and I feel so unseen and unheard and et cetera. And I'm like, wow, like you've made it two decades without having a major crisis of some kind. And it's, it's really challenging for folks. I think just inherently kind of like you mentioned in your example, Kitty, the more personalities you have involved in a beautiful system and network of relationship, you're going to have more of those moments and you're going to have more of them frequently. Uh, And they're probably smaller than like the example I just gave with that couple, but therefore you get to actually build some resilience, practice, uh, grow, grow more secure attachment because Trust isn't something that we're just all given at the beginning of a relationship. It's built over time. Mm-hmm. And, it, and I think that the concept of rupture and repair as being a foundational part of how we learn to trust, I'll trust you even that much more if we have a misunderstanding and then we can come back together. Mm-hmm. Um, And so I guess all that to say, in general, I think attachment can be something where polyamory can be extremely healing. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And and I tend towards that more optimistic view of it because I think whether it's my friends or my clients, um, I've seen that time and time again, where the self-knowledge and the ability to go through rupture and repair in a healthy way 
is fostered in part by practice, Mm -hmm. which maybe you get less of in a long-term monogamous commitment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing all that so eloquently. And I have heard stated that when folks are in a monogamous relationship, and again, monogamy works for a lot of people, so there's obviously nothing wrong with it. It's simply a choice, but that it could mask if there is some um, insecurity and almost parade around like it's it's securely attached when maybe there's some work to be done there. I wonder if there was anything you cared to you know, mention about that that resonates with you, that doesn't resonate with you. What are your thoughts on that? Yes. I, the term that comes to mind is structural security. Mm. Um, so say you have sort of the standard relationship escalator of a heteronormative monogamous couple. You know, they go on the dates, they move in together, they get a dog, then they get married, then they have kids, then they buy a house, like on and on up the relationship escalator. All of those things provide security structurally. Mm -hmm. We're legally bound to each other. We share a bank account. We have biological offspring together that we're trying to keep alive and raise and be healthy with. Mm -hmm. And the structural pieces of that, while they can certainly result in security, they can also sort of give um, uh, only so deep security. The emotional security we're talking about with attachment, Mm -hmm. that comes from feeling like you can both have someone you can tell. And and this gets into like uh, the vulnerability that comes through relationship with somebody that you can tell those dark and difficult things to and somebody that can support you when you go out and take a risk in the world and somebody that can comfort you when you come back and life's just been hard for a minute. That is security. And I think sometimes we can supplant the the difficult, <laughs> vulnerable security with, well, we share a house and I can trust that we're going to keep living in this house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in polyamory, where you don't necessarily have those same structures, uh, if we're talking about security, it comes through choice and it comes through showing up for the other person. And showing up for the other person, not out of obligation. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think that that is, yeah, one of the many beautiful things about mm-hmm. how attachment can show up in a healthy way in a poly context. Mm, I love that. I want to underscore that, that with, with polyamory and, and ethical non-monogamy as well, that it's partly about choice, choosing to be there, choosing to repair the things that need to be repaired, um, and I, one thing I wanted to ask, because I think this even came up in your workshop, is choosing to be the other person's safe harbor or safe haven. I think somebody mm-hmm. asked, what's the difference, if uh, our listeners are familiar with those two different words, between safe harbor versus safe haven? That could be helpful, because I also think mm-hmm. that kind of comes in the context of feeling secure. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, the, these terms come from John Bowlby, one of the the original... Um, theorists and it's secure base and safe haven slash harbor Mm, okay um the secure base is feeling like your partner supports you when you're about to go out on an adventure you're about to take a new job you're about to hold a boundary with your parent you're about to whatever you're about to go out and explore the world in some way um, and you feel like you can do so because you have somebody in your corner. That's the secure base piece. Mm-hmm. The safe haven is the place you can come back to and you can have that hug and mm-hmm. someone can look at you and say, you don't have to talk about it unless you want to. I'm here. And they know how you receive comfort. They know your love language. They can help you feel like you have a safe place to come back to when life has just kicked you in the teeth a little bit Mm -hmm. or a lot of it (laughs) right and 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 that interplay i think it's interesting and i found this in my relationships i've had partners who are better at being the secure base 
and others who are much, much more comforting and better at being that safe haven. And Mm -hmm. that I've I've had my own needs really well met through that constellation Mm -hmm. of partners. Mm -hmm. Um, My ex-wife was extremely supportive of all my adventures. Mm -hmm. I... I've gone all around the world to climb and ski big mountains. Um, strange hobby. And she was always like, yeah, swing for the fences. Go to Asia. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and two of my boyfriends were way, way, way uh, more skilled at just being that shoulder to cry on, <laughs> the arm mm-hmm. around the shoulder, mm-hmm. the... I don't have to understand your emotional reality to know it's your reality and I can meet you in it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that beautiful explanation. I think that will help a lot of people just to have that. I love having, that's the way I view language. Like you said, like it's just a way to help us to communicate. Doesn't have to be, you know, anything heavy, deep and real. But I think that the distinction between secure base and then that safe haven, safe harbor, that's, um, That's profound. And especially when you're adding in the concept of ethical non-monogamy and multiple partners. And we don't necessarily have to get super annoyed if one person's really good at this one and the other person's really good at this one. Like when you have multiple partners, you can be like, hey, look, you're all helping meet my needs. That's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love that. Anything else that you'd like to share about either this topic or or your work, or maybe something I haven't asked that you'd like to touch on? Um, well, I think in addition to Jessica Fern's book, the other book recommendation I would throw out is Polyamory, a Clinical Toolkit by Martha Kalpe. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly a, a denser, heavier book. Mm-hmm. It's written not only for clinicians, but also for folks who are not. Um, And Kalpi does a really phenomenal job with her uh, appendices at the back. Tons of self-reflective worksheets. As a clinician, I'm suggesting ideas from those often to my clients. And uh, (laughs) maybe you don't read her 400-page textbook on the topic, Mm -hmm. but you go to certain chapters, you pull out certain ideas, and then those worksheets in the back are just awesome. So mm-hmm. if we're, you know, plugging a resource, I'd say that one right up there with PolySecure mm-hmm. um, comes to mind. And I guess the the only other um, big concept that comes up a ton in my work I was thinking about in advance of this is making the implicit explicit. Um or as Dan Savage says, use your words. Mm-hmm. Um, so often I see see issues with attachment come up where people are feeling insecure, they're feeling anxious, they're feeling avoidant, they're not feeling connected to their partner. And so often it's because they think implicitly what is so obvious to them must also be obvious to their partner. Mm. And so much connection comes from the simple act of saying it out loud Mm -hmm. or asking for something out loud or making a disclosure, taking the implicit and making it explicit. Um, And that that's a running theme in so much of my work Mm. with so many people. Mm -hmm. So that's one I would throw out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's uh, definitely see that a lot in my work that some of the repairs that may need to happen is there can become like a pattern or a habit of expecting the other partner to read your mind. You know, if you love me, you would just know that I'm right. X, right? <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> and instead, this is just like, hey, we're, we're human beings and uh, I got a to-do list of 20 things to do. I'm not actively sitting here thinking, oh, I can't wait to read your mind. <laughs> So just being able to say it, which can take courage, it can take vulnerability and resilience, you know? Mm -hmm. So to your point, also feeling safe to be able to share, you know, or to ask is, um, I think, some of the the work to be done. Um, Well, awesome. Well, I would just love to uh, thank you for your time. By the way, uh, Halpy has been on the podcast. If you didn't listen to that interview, we do talk about the book. Yeah, so you can... 
Yeah, I'm exactly. gonna go back and listen to that one. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I bought the book, but yes, I was intimidated by the 400 pages. So I have not cracked it open just yet. Um, <laughs> but I have it. When I got it, I was like, "Oh my goodness, it's like 10 pounds." Uh, oh. But but it's great to know that there's all those great worksheets in the back. So thanks for letting me know that, and our, and of course all of our listeners. So um, yeah, I would just say, is there uh, before we just kind of start to wrap up and tell people where to find your work? And maybe just ask a, a fun question to close. Is there any bits of uh, wisdom or anything that you would like to leave our listeners with as a parting thought? Mm. Uh, I suppose we talk about trusting your gut and your intuition. And I think that that's a very, you know, well said thing. Uh, slowing down slowing down so that you might actually be able to tune into what your gut is saying. I say this as someone who's always moving between one thing to the next. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, slowing down to really listen. Mm -hmm. I think that would be. That's beautiful. And, and that inspires a question and also in terms of attachment, which is in multiple relationships, if one person really wants to go fast, mm -hmm. um, I've seen even in my own personal experience that that can bring up a lot of anxiety and issues if the other person's like, whoa, man, you are going way too fast. What's going on here? Um, right. And, and so that, I love how that can be the pacing issue. But we've probably been talking about like slowing yourself down. Um, mm -hmm. What about what are your thoughts about like if if one person is like super excited to go super fast with multiple relationships and the other person's triggering some of their anxiety? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think this actually is a, a phenomenal parallel to mountaineering, which oh. is you can only move as fast as the slowest hiker in your group. Mm. Mm -hmm. And having been in the mountains and having gone too fast and suffered a little bit of altitude sickness or uh, fatigue before getting out of harm's way, if you're not really in tune with your own pacing as well as your partners, you put the whole system at risk. And so I guess my encouragement there would be to name the joy and the excitement of wanting to go fast and dive in and like, yes, let us, let us just be exuberant with our new relationship energy. And that, that series of warning bells and cautionary anxious feelings coming from one of the partners, very valid. And they don't have to be exclusive, but both have to be held. And and I'd say to the faster paced partner, can you find a way to be joyful and slow it down, at least in response to this one person's needs? Mm -hmm. um, because then you're going to hike together for longer. <laughs> you're not going to you're not going to have to like to continue the mountaineering metaphor. You're not going to have to bail on the route. You're not going to have to do an emergency evac. You're not going to push mm -hmm. the system past what it's able to handle. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That was really beautiful. And I'm sure will help a lot of the folks who are listening to this episode. So um, just you're awesome. I'm so glad that I got to meet you and got to have this incredible interview with you. Mm -hmm. So many insights. So with that, where can people find you and your work? Thank you. I, I'm so glad to have been here. Mm -hmm. My website is Altura CC. So it's A L T U R A C C dot com. And I'm on Instagram at shade underscore Jess. Feel free to reach out anyway. I'm always happy to chat, answer questions, point towards resources. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. Well, you are just a delight. I wish you so much success. I hope to maybe go skiing with you someday. Who knows? Yes. So, <laughs> oh gosh, that would be awesome. And just, just sending you so much love and keep doing what you're doing. Like I'm sure you will, because this is uh, this information is so needed, and the work that you're doing is incredible. So, um, and I hope you just have so much fun um, and keep navigating your moment in on the planet as well through everything that you shared with us so vulnerably here. So thank you for all of that. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you heard, are struggling with some aspect of your relationships, 
and you're interested in seeing if you're a fit to work with me as your relationship coach, here's what I invite you to do next. Head over to lovingwithoutboundaries.com forward slash apply. That's lovingwithoutboundaries.com forward slash apply and book a call to speak with me. I'll get on the phone with you for about 45 minutes and we'll get you crystal clear on three things. Number one, exactly what's not working well in your relationships right now. Number two, ideally where you'd like to be and what might be getting in the way. And number three, the exact strategy to get you there, helping to close that gap. Remember, creating healthy, open relationships does not typically happen by itself. Many often need expert guidance to make it happen. We've helped clients all over the world to feel safe, happy, and secure in open relationships while not losing their mind or their cherished partners. To see if we can help you do the same, head over to lovingwithoutboundaries.com forward slash apply. I'm Kitty Shambliss, and let's talk soon.